from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So welcome back to Rare Book and Special Collections Division, everyone. Um, we're very excited about today's talk. Uh, Glenn A. Mill is a, a collector and a donor to uh, the Library of Congress, the collection that you're hearing about today, the Edward uh, Gorey collection. Uh, it now resides in this division. It was a wonderful gift that came in uh, last year. Um, and it also came with Glenn. <laughs> who, who, now re, who now resides in our division on a regular basis. Um, he's uh, not only an expert collector that brought in 800 pieces of Goriana, uh, but is also a compiler of the Goriography, uh, his <laughs> online uh, a bibliography of Gori pieces. So he brings a great deal of expertise. Um, he's a, a great chap. He's become a real friend of the division, um, actually a colleague already at this point. We're really thrilled to have him here. And uh, he's going to talk about something that we have all grown to love. If you didn't love Gory before, you'll love him after this. So please welcome Glenn. Thank you, Mark. Well, um, well, he already introduced me. So I can just uh, tell you that I started collecting Gory when I was about 18 years old. So had a good time. Uh, the challenge was actually being 18, not having a lot of income at the time. Um, trying to find Gori on the cheap without the internet. <laughs> so, fortunately, it wasn't too difficult. I think there are maybe one or two spots that we need to fill in, and you can call it an, a 100% collection. Um, of course, you know, there are 800 pieces, but Gori only published about 100 and, uh, and some odd of his own original books. Um, he's done maybe two, 300 uh, illustrations for other publications and periodicals. I'll go over that. Um, but I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for coming, this is really heartwarming. And I really do like this place. This is, this is what my life, I want my library to look like this. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I want it. That's why I like, you let me hang out here. And this, is, this is why. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. I. Um, I have a small presentation. It's um, into, broken into two parts. Um, for those who don't know Gori's Biblia, uh, some of the major details about his career, I provide that. I apologize. I understand uh, after speaking to Mark that I'm not a professional presenter, so I don't, I don't know how to do this very well. But um, I have text and I have images. So for those who really, really dislike watching what I'm saying, I have on the right hand of the screen will be images of the entire collection of books passing through. And um, to keep it interesting, I have a prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I say, there's about 106 books that can be attributed to him directly, but um, I've omitted presenting the albums the uh, Amphigori series, and that leaves four more books that aren't presented. So if there are any collectors out there who actually can name the three of those four books <laughs> that are missing from the screen presentation, then I have a Edward Gorey pin <laughs> from, made by the Edward Gorey House up in Cape Cod. It's a very nice one. It's almost like Fosamé. So. Three, uh, three books, name three books that I don't show <laughs> outside, of, outside of Amphigory. Let's get this clear. Three, three books that are in the Amphigory series but that are not going to be on your presentation? That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Three books out of the entire collection that aren't shown outside of the Amphigory volumes themselves. There are four of them. I didn't, I didn't photograph them. So there, there are four individual books of his that he wrote that won't be shown. So if you can think of those, I think you have a collection, right? <laughs> so before we get started, a, um, Mark brought up a, a good point. Um, I think it'd be interesting to know uh, that 
along with um, part of Gori's charm is that he's a very mysterious man. He's as mysterious as the books that he's written. And um, so there's a lot of talk, a lot of hearsay generated. So I'm going to try to expose one or two of those if this will let me. It is said that Edward Gorey It is. This is what's mysterious about it. Sorry. It's the words, it's not the pictures. Ah. Anyway, I was saying that, um, did it come up? No, no signal. No signal. Ah, okay. So, as I was saying, Edward Gorey, there's a lot, of leg a lot of legends, a lot of myths about Edward Gorey. One of them might be that he was actually a child of a refugee from the turn of the century. Russian, uh, a Russian czar left his children in England and he got stuck on a boat and came here. Another one is that he might have English, he might be English and ran to America and to apply his trade here. Or that he also has a very famous mother who's a, uh, who happens to be either a songstress or a dancer or a famous mysterious actress. Let's see, we, let's see if we can find. Pardon? I said, ask your wife. My wife? Yes. was Edward Gorey's mother for 11 years, maybe, 8 to 11 years. It's not entirely clear. But he was, uh, he, uh, his, he and his father were divorced um, when he was 11. And then he, um, uh, his, his father had remarried. And when he was 27 years old, his parents reunited again. So for a brief period, Edward Gorey did have a very interesting mother. Um, anyway, so I explained about the, uh, the story. Um, I'm going to just basically indulge me while I read the, the text portion. The right side will show eventually the books uh, in Gory's collection. Um, in 1925, Everett Gory is born 22nd in Chicago, Illinois. He has no siblings. He develops a taste for reading and drawing and pursues creative activities in theater, writing in his formative years. By the time Gory is five years old, he has read Dracula, Alice, and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by nine. And supposedly, Dracula terrifies him. In 1943, he studies at the Chicago Art Institute for one semester. That's his formal training. 
In 1946, Edward enrolls at Harvard University, majoring in French literature. While there, he becomes involved with poets, theater, and Cambridge, eventually befriending John Ashbery, Frank O'Hara, Alison Lurie, and Bunny Lang. Gorey starts shopping at the Gotham Book Mart in Manhattan in 1946, and he meets Francis Stelloff, um, who later agrees to help sell his books. He also uh, starts, um, hmm. I thought it would change. Uh, in 1952, Jason Epstein, a friend of, Gore, of his, takes over at Doubleday Anchor Paperbacks, which used to be just kind of low quality paperback books, and asks Gorey to leave the art department. Gorey accepts, and for the next seven years, he polishes craft of book illustration, layout, and typography. And the book series is very successful. Now, there's about 60 of these book covers, and they have a very distinctive, a very beautiful touch to them. And, uh, and some collectors just collect those books. And, and they're, they're hard to find, some of them, because uh, a lot of them are just trash, thrown away after they're. In 1953, he publishes his first book, The Unstrung Harp, and moves from the Boston area to Manhattan. And over time, Gorey publishes at least two books a year until his death, creating his stories first and then illustrating them. Gorey produces camera-ready artwork and typography, and except for the stage work, he doesn't reduce or enlarge his drawings. 1957, impressed by the ballet under George, George Balanchine's guidance, and Gorey embarks upon a dedicated resolve to attend every performance of the New York City <laughs> Ballet. Apparently it was true, and by 1982, he had quenched his thirst for the most ephemeral, ephemeral of arts. But he has openly said that this is probably the strongest influence on his style. In 1959, he starts work as editor and art director at Looking Glass Library, another Epstein venture at Random House. Until, he clo chooses, until that closes three years later, Gorey finds this job to be the most satisfying because he actually got to choose some of the stories as well as illustrate some of the art cover work. In 1962, unable to find a publisher for The Beastly Baby, Gorey self-publishes it under the Fantide Press name. The Fantide Press eventually publishes 28 of his works, many of which doesn't attract mainstream publishers. And besides The Beastly Baby, other Gorey classics from the Fantide Press includes The Chinese Obelisks, The Deranged Cousins, The Disrespectful Summons, The Evil Garden, which I like very much, The Lost Lions, The Osbit Bird, and The Pious Infant and the Untitled Book. Gorey publishes The Vinegar Works in 1963, a three-volume set including his famous The Gashley Crumb Tinies, with A's for Amy who fell down the stairs. His favorite job and as Looking Glass Library folds, and so he takes a designer position at Bob's Merrill. He finds this assignment difficult, so, buoyed by his modest success so far, Gorey decides to launch his freelance career. In 1965, Gorey's first solo art exhibit opens at the California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland, across the bridge from San Francisco. Although he does not attend this exhibit, he ships over 190 of his own original artworks. Um, Gorey also begins teaching classes on advanced children's book illustration at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, and this lasts for one semester. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> In 1967, Andreas Brown, a young antiquarian book appraiser and bibliographer from California, buys the Gotham bookmark from Francis Stelloff. Already a fan of Gorey's work, he begins actively to promote Gorey's art and literature, and this includes yearly art exhibits at Gotham's Art Gallery, co-managing Gorey's publications and building a small but growing clientele of collectors thirsty for Gorey's limited editions. And by this time, Gorey has published 24 books. Mr. Brown is uh, still involved in the Gorey community. He's um, on the go on. As many of, as many of Gorey's as no, were issued with fewer than 500 copies each, uh, Brown suggested that he assemble them in a affordable collection. And that became Anthony in 1972. It wins notable Book of the Year awards from the New York Times and American Institute of Graphic Arts. And it still has been in print ever since. Um, may believe that this is more or less what launched his, his book career. Was that Andres Brown? That was Andres Brown, yes, in the, uh, 19, quite a few years ago. 
where he designs, in 1977, he designed the sets and costumes for Broadway's revival of Dracula, starring Frank Langella at the Martin Beck Theater. The show's a huge hit with over 900 performances. And as Gorey owns a piece of the show, it allows him to buy a cozy home near the family, near his family in Cape Cod in Barnstable. Gorey also wins a Tony Award for his costume design, not stage design, for costume design, and he didn't like that at all. <laughs> Gorey purchases his dream house, a sea captain's home built in 1821 in Yarmouth Port. In 1980, Gorey is asked to design opening and closing credits for the PBS mystery series. He works with Canadian broadcasting animator Derek Lamb, and he also creates the hand-drawn two-dimensional stage sets, prompting Vincent Price to call it Gorey's Mansion. Okay. From 1980 to his death, Gorey publishes 40 more books, creates over 20 small stage plays, and renders several hundred drawings for other books, periodicals, and <laughs> so on and so on. <laughs> these are great. There's got to be at least four or five different iterations of this yeah. animation. And um, <laughs> Gorey, <laughs> originally Gorey said, his plan would have taken somewhere along like 30 minutes of animation. <laughs> they, they cut it down to <laughs> just under two minutes. In 1980, Andreas Brown estimates by, uh, that Gorey had produced well over 10,000 drawings over his lifetime. In 1983, Gorey leaves Manhattan, moves to Cape Cod permanently. Gorey tells people that this is precipitated by the recent death of Balanchine. But Gorey lives happily on the Cape with a handful of cats until his death. <laughs> and um, Andreas Brown is currently the co-trustee of the Edward Gorey Trust. They handle all the original artwork and intellectual property rights. And um, so the archive, he says, just box, dozens of boxes of just illustrations that Gorey never used. He would just draw. So the estimate of 10,000 illustrations is conservative. No, this probably goes back before published work, but. On April 13th, 2000, Gorey suffers a massive heart attack in his home while his friend Rick Jones repairs a toaster in the kitchen. He's rushed to Hyannis Hospital, but two days later he dies from complications. Gorey was 75 and was survived by two cousins and a nephew. Gorey chooses to be cremated. Half of his ashes were set adrift off a beach on Cape Cod Bay by his friends and family. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> In 2002, Gorey's home opens to the public as the Edward Gorey House, a museum dedicated to preserving his legacy. His original artwork, is, like I mentioned, is archived by the Edward Gorey Charitable Trust. His personal library of 25,000 books is housed at San Diego Library State University in California. Most of Gorey's personal effects were distributed amongst his friends, and according to his will, Gorey wanted his artwork to continue in perpetuity to benefit animal welfare. Before he died, Gorey and Rick Jones were discussing funerals, and Gorey said, just throw me in the yard. <laughs> so 11 years later, his friend honored his request. Gorey's last remaining ashes were scattered along with four, his last four cats around his property in Yarmouth, Park, Yarmouth Port. And this is one of his plays that was performed at the scattering of the ashes.
I was at that performance, and afterwards, Rick Jones told me that they hadn't planned on putting the, the picture of Gory up at the very end, because this was just a re supposedly just a restaging of several of his plays. So, thank you for sitting through the tough part. <laughs> that was just a lot of information. But, um, yeah, the, um, the Scattering of the Ashes was a very interesting um, show. It, we, it showed that uh, Gory's work was just as strong on the play side, the, the whole entire community of, of players, uh, puppet players and so on, the puppets being those little white head figures of paper mache, Gory had made about a hundred of those little things about the shape, about an inch, in, you know, an inch or so. So they didn't have much detail. But the second part of the presentation is just more or less the subjective, my opinion about what makes Gory so interesting. Um, one of the things um, that uh, Gore used to tell people when, whenever people asked him what does any of it mean, and even the person who used to ask this question was Andreas Braun himself, and Gore would just almost always invariably say, you see, what you see is what you get. And, um, and I think that answer more or less just managed to uh, push off a lot of people, but I think when you think about what Gore was, think, was talking about, what you see is what you get, what you understand, you can, you can take this as what you understand is what you can read into it. He loved it when people read into his work um, only because it showed how engaged people were. Um, he didn't divulge meanings pretty much of any of his works. He would say, uh, read into it, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take whatever you feel like, your, whatever translation you come up with. But there are some things that he really enjoyed. What you're seeing here is some of the old, some old footage of films of Louis Fouillard. Um, this one happens to be from Fantomas. Um, when Gory was uh, in Harvard, um, they used to watch, um, and the, also in New York, um, they would look for performances. <coughs> this, is, this is 100 years old. Uh, most, this, was, this particular one was done in 1914. It was a series of um, what's called, uh, the French hated it. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't supposedly the high art of filmmaking. So they had, I forgot the name they gave it, but it wasn't a complimentary one. But Gory truly found something in it. And I think some, in a way you can actually see some of his style being used here. I mean, it's, it, this is truly different than a lot of silent film movies especially the setting, the stage. Um, uh, uh, an analyst, uh, a critic for film, had an, a wonderful interpretation about uh, the Fouillard films. These were films that were not, of course, um, popular because they were, the, the narration proved to be somewhat deceptive. Fouillard enjoyed the leading a narration that wasn't necessarily showing on the screen. So that oftentimes the audience would have to come up with their own conclusion at the end because it wasn't a straightforward narration. And I think Gory really picked up on that style of not knowing whose perspective, who's telling the story and what is gonna happen at the end. It's not a very linear kind of, unless you watch it over and over again, you're not gonna know what's gonna happen next. This is the original music that came with these. It's very interesting, it's very surreal. And the colors were also intentional. Another um, favorite of Gori's was The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. And um, her thousand year old novel, um, Gori read um, and found, read several, several times and just, he never exhausted, he never became exhausted from um, some of the details it's known that um, the tale of Genji uses um, what's known as mono no aware, which is basically the transient moment that's captured. Um, it can be captured by a simple expression of o oh or ah. And so mono no aware can also be seen as the 
um, magic moment, the, the breathing moment that will, know, that will pass eventually. And I think Gori really latched onto that as well. Um, <coughs> he was a very sensitive man. Um, he was never married, as a matter of fact. Um, he's come out a couple of, in a couple of interviews and said that he was asexual as his preference. But we do know that he has very, he's had quite a few very, very close relationships with um, other people, um, soulmate kind of relationships. One of the more remarkable ones was uh, with Peter Neumeier. Um, he, uh, he had done three books with Peter Neumeier um, and the exchange of, of ideas and so on that the two men shared is truly, truly remarkable. And Gory and Peter Neumeier, who had a family, was raising a family on the East Coast while teaching, um, was interesting enough to come up. Uh, somebody had, Peter Neumeier had um, saved his letters that he and Gory used to uh, go over all these details about coming up with these books. And they talked about art, literature, and so on. That's just absolutely fascinating. The book that just came out about five years ago is called Floating, Floating Worlds, still available. But it, if you do want to find the kind of thread that Gory loves to dwell on, uh, it, a lot of it's there. That was the letters? The letters, the correspond, correspondence between <coughs> Peter Neumeier and Edward Gorey. Edward Gorey also had several other friends who he had very, very close relationships as well, as well but the letters are obviously are unique to Peter Neumeier. Um, and ballet, of course. Everyone knows that Edward Gorey loved George Balanchine's work at the New York City Ballet. Um, and a lot of that flamboyance and freedom of the characters shows up in his work. Um, not just the moments of ballet, the books written of ballet directly, but he has several uh, characters that truly can say, reflect the artistic freedom of ballet, a transient um, uh, moments that ballet brings to the stage and brings to light in them. Um, Gory loves savoring some of those and tries to convey some of that in his work. Um, spent many hours talking to Andreas Brown and other collectors and people who love Gory, and there's the, the list of influences are huge. They're enormous. He's very well read, loved several artists, um, enough to say that he wishes, he wishes he could draw like, let's say, Edward Artisoni or um, the drawing techniques, but his work is, is very unique and in the sense that he tries to convey more than just literature. He's a storyteller. I think he uses whatever medium and whatever style that actually helps produce the most interesting story. If you look at the, um, if you look at the stage settings, you can almost see some of Gory's attention to detail framed the in the wallpaper, the, the fabric designs, the uh, furniture. It's just and I love how he's picked up on that. He's not just imitating it. He's just he. Sh in a lot of his work, he shows some of the details that helps isolate the story. So, um, I think those are some. Of, these are some of some of the things that I've come up with. I'm sure everyone. People have ideas as well about what makes Gory click for them and click for other people. He's Gory is interesting that a lot of people will readily admit they don't understand Gory, mm -hmm. and I find that 
wonderful. <laughs> that they just, they would just come out and say, I don't understand any of this at all. Um, Supposedly, he and Alison Lurie, one of his early friends from Harvard, would spend, have spent hundreds of hours watching some of these in, in the vaults. Um, not in the vaults, but in the festivals that would show up every once in a while in, um, in Boston. Somebody would uncover some of these old things. Well, he wrote an introduction to one of the festivals. Yeah. Yes, he did. He did. Pretty sure that Gordon had watched these. Oh, without doubt, without doubt, he'd seen these. Um, his favorite free odd films were Barabbas. Um, I haven't seen Barabbas, but I understand it's available now, so I think it's worth worth taking a look at. Um, he was also, but he also loved the Fantomas series, and um, it's a very, very long, very, very long series. It's a wonderful series. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, that's my presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? And does anybody have an idea about which books we're missing? <laughs> yes. I have no idea about which books we're missing, sadly. I don't know the first time I walked, but I'm curious if you ever met him. Um, well, I wanted to meet him. I lived in San Francisco when I was doing most of my collecting, so it was the choice of either going out and visiting Edward Gorey meant a book or two or three, <laughs> actually 10. <laughs> um, I also wanted to give Gorey his space because by that time, I was collecting in 1978, started, and by 1990, I think most people understood that Gorey was constantly approached by his fans who were just, you know, let's come up and stand, just to stand with him, and uh, that would be it. But, and I didn't want to be so intrusive, so I decided to just be happy with his output and just kind of imagine the rest. Um, after he passed away, I became, as a collector, and after putting my um, uh, collection online, and it's more or less a portal that, has, that allows people to, to explore Gory's world a little bit, not just from one side, but from plays and from books and uh, from around the world. Gory, how there's Gory collectors all over the world who um, have sites as well. And they have interesting things that they put up, so I, I create links, and, as well as a bibli bibliography of his main works. Um, I'm sorry, you had the, 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 oh, okay. I, I was just the yeah, yeah. Yes. What made you decide to donate your collection to the library? Uh, well, I wanted to find a much better home. My collection, after dragging it from California to here, um, the humidity, the weather, and so on, I just I could watch it withering away at the edges of the pages. The pages were turning colors. Um, and I just it was breaking my heart. And I just wanted it to actually be preserved. In one, in one piece, because it's just a remarkable, remarkable amount of energy um, to put together, and uh, so um, I think it came up. Somebody had knew someone who had visited the Edward Gorey House. I'm a member of the uh, member of the board of the Edward Gorey House, so I get some of these information of some of the travelers. And um, the head of your poetry department had come to the Edward Gorey House two years ago, and that came up. And, uh, and we just a few thoughts came around and thought, you know, this would be a perfect place for Edward Gorey to, to be. Have you kept back anything? <laughs> <laughs> Should I tell you? <laughs> a particular treasure, David? Uh, actually, there is one, and it's got a very gory esque kind of um, almost ending. Um, he has, Gory loved to make these little stuffed dolls, and I'll let you, let you go to look at these things in a bit. Um, just last week, it was one of the treasures I decided to keep. It was a, um, a Fig Bash doll, very, very long arms. Um, I guess there's nothing quite like it here. Anyway, it's filled with rice. So you can imagine what rice, 
uh, that sounds like to a mouse. Uh, <laughs> and unfortunately, I thought it was in a very safe place. And just a couple of weeks ago, I, I opened it up, and lo and behold, the mice had been munching on fig bashes. <laughs> but you know, I, I have to say, it, it really doesn't bother me, because at, at this point, I think the bulk of the collection is safe now from mice. <laughs> okay, uh, it was kind of gory-esque, but apparently gory loved animals too, and I can see why. You know, if, if, if we have a very valuable piece here, and, and nature comes along and decides to do natural things to it, <laughs> I, it, it didn't bother me. It should bother me, but it doesn't. <laughs> yes? Something about the poster here, the green covers, so I have to see books. Ah, well, these two. Are you talking about the um, the, the first second, one. the first one? Yes. Uh, oh, this one here. Yes. Oh, this this would be um, a, a what they call a bus size advertisement for Mystery, the TV series. So he he oh. did the animation, and he would create these large advertisement posters to be used in public spaces like bus stops and so on. So this is probably the largest, I mean, Gory draws to scale. So this is his work. Um, and this is a good one actually, um, to look at the details. And when you get a chance, I'll let you look around because I'm sure you're really here for the books. Um, there's a lot of fascinating, mostly um, and natural, supernatural little hints mm -hmm. running all over these the artwork here. So this is an excellent example. This is the the second poster is from the same series, but it just tips. It looks like the animation. So this one was um, yes. I think he tries to encapsulate some of the stories that were being told in the seasons. Um, I don't know which ones are the Christie's or but. He was an enormous fan of Ag Agatha Christie, as everyone knows. Um, and possibly, you know, people call, like to call Edward Gorey's work macabre, but when you think about it, Agatha Christie, no one calls Agatha Christie macabre, so. Uh, <laughs> but he didn't do any of the covers, did he? For Agatha Christie? Yeah. You know, that's interesting, no. No. Not that I know. Mm -hmm. um, some of his favorite works um, he, he would have loved to become involved in, but he didn't. Um, I think he was waiting for someone to ask. That's more or less what happened. Most of Gory's artwork was produced by someone who just came up and said, okay, you think you, you can do this? He said, okay. He was very amiable to doing whatever. I get this firsthand from Andreas Brown. Andreas and I are, are good friends, and he's, he's told me a lot about Gory. I hope somebody actually walks up to Andreas and follows him around the paper for him. <laughs> he knows the, the story that's not in not print about it with Gory. And, uh, um, maybe I can drag him down here one day. <laughs> I'm going to um, stop the questions there if we can. That's that nice one. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.